Come celebrate the life that is all around you. We celebrate the life that is blessed by Jesus Christ our Lord. Come offer your praise and thanksgiving to God our Creator. Let us sing our hallelujahs to the Lord.
above God, above all else, and second, to love one another. Let us confess our failure to love as well as God loved us. Lord, we give thanks for the love you have extended to us. We confess that we have not always loved you with our whole heart, mind, soul, and strength. We have not always given those around us with compassion and care, honor, and grace with his hand to us. Sometimes we need the hell to treat ourselves as loving kindness.
Grace and peace to you from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Let us share these blessings with one another. May the peace of Christ be with you.
This is the word of the Lord. So we're going to call this one Breakfast with Jesus. And I think this might be my favorite of the resurrection stories because it's so casual. Here's how I watch it. The disciples have been hanging out together waiting for the promised Holy Spirit because at the end of Luke's Gospel, this is what Jesus told them. Now I will send the Holy Spirit just as my Father promised, but stay here in the city until the Holy Spirit comes and fills you with power from heaven. They didn't know when that was coming or what to do in the meantime, and they got restless waiting for it. I mean, seriously. How many humans are good at waiting? Are you? I'm not. Well, apparently, rather than staying in Jerusalem, several of them headed towards home because this story takes place on the Sea of Galilee, and that's quite a ways north of Jerusalem where the events of Holy Week took place. You notice that the restless aren't too good at following directions either? They didn't stay in the city? That's another human trait we might share with them. So all the fishing brothers, that's Peter and Andrew, James and John, they were all from Galilee. Nathaniel was from Cana, and that's not too far away. Several of them were still together, it seems, and hopefully they were still waiting for that promise to be fulfilled. But once they got back on familiar turf, Peter the also says, enough of this, I'm going fishing. Who's going with me? And they were just as bored as he was, so a bunch of them went on an overnight fishing trip. Well, it seems they still own or had access to a fishing boat in all year. Maybe those Zebedee boys, James and John, took Dad's boat out for a spin, because they had left it with him when they took off to follow Jesus. They pushed off to sea, and off they went. But hard as they worked all night, they didn't catch a thing. And I suspect by dawn this fishing trip wasn't as exciting as it had seemed the night before. You know, isn't that just the way it is? If you insist on pushing ahead with your own plans instead of waiting on God's plan, chances are you're going to come up empty-handed. It pays to have the patience to wait on the Lord's timing. Well, that's where this story turned around. Someone on shore shouted out to them, Catch anything, guys? Well, no, they haven't. They have to admit. Well, put down your net on the right side. Now, think a minute about how that translated into English. Because it carries a double meaning that way. The directions might have meant right versus left side of the boat, but the subtle message underneath it to us is, you're doing it all wrong, boys. Let me show you the right way. Now, they complained that they had worked all night and that caught a thing. In the back of their minds, you know some of them have to have been thinking, who does this guy think he is anyway? What does he know about fishing? We've been at it all night, there just aren't any fish here. And I got to that point in writing this message and thought, ouch. Because I'm as guilty of that as anyone else. I've complained that I've tried things and they didn't work. In fact, I had said that at least twice in the three days before sitting down to work on this message. We've all got a lesson to learn from this one. The fishermen decided to give it one more try, and they put down their nets on the right side of the boat. Lo and behold, the net could barely hold so many fish, 153 big ones, and it's no fisherman's tale because this is the gospel according to John's memory at least. So what do we say to that? Jesus proved them wrong, just as he has proven me so many times. There are fish out there after all, plenty of them. And it reminds me when Jesus said to Peter, Oh, ye of little faith. This is a faith lesson for us on trusting God to guide us. And that's a 
big part of why Jesus was sending the Holy Spirit to them to guide them with God's wisdom and God's plan. Well, it's about this point that John noticed something. And I picture him kind of poking Peter in the ribs and saying, that's Jesus on shore. Peter looked, and as impulsive as ever, he jumped in and he waded ashore, running as best he could through water. I'm pretty sure they were close enough to shore that he could get there. The New Living Translation says it was about 100 yards, so that's a football field. And there is a curve at one point in the Sea of Galilee that looks like it'd be pretty shallow and close to shore. I imagine John or some of the others about this time were thinking, there he goes again. He's not even going to help us bring in the boat. Guilty again. How often have I complained that I don't think someone else is doing their share of the work? Isn't that human nature too? We do the tasks that we enjoy and we put off other things that we'd rather avoid. Or like Peter, we get distracted and we forget that others might need our help. Then again, if this were a Mary and Martha story, then Peter's okay and John's guilty of complaining too much. We have to see where the story goes. I'm guessing the disciples brought the boat in closer and they dragged the net above the water line and just left it there. And as it turns out, Jesus has already cooked breakfast. Roasted fish over a campfire, it sounds pretty good, doesn't it? Jesus must have caught that first round himself, though I don't know when. And he urged them to bring some of their catch to add to the meal. Finally, Peter realizes it's his turn. He drags that strong net full of fish the rest of the way. And they sit around the campfire on the beach and have breakfast with Jesus. And doesn't that make a great scene? Wouldn't you like to be part of that breakfast club? Of course, there's more to the story, including a significant and intense conversation that's coming up, but that's next week's message. I want you to imagine what it felt like that day. I want you to put yourself in the story. So I'm going to switch to present tense, and if it helps you to picture things by closing your eyes, you're welcome to do that. This is something you can do with any Bible story in your own devotional time. Put yourself into it. So I want you to imagine that you're one of the disciples sitting around that campfire having breakfast. We're having a relaxed meal with Jesus. None of the tension from the Last Supper is hanging over us right now. Maybe there's still a little jostling for who sits where and who gets to talk next. I doubt that very human aspect of it has changed too drastically in just a few weeks. We're in Jesus' resurrection days. There's only 40 of them, so this scene is maybe a month or so after the events of the Last Supper in the upper room. The mood is relaxed with a sense of relief. We're enjoying these times with Jesus, getting used to him showing up. But these appearances are all the more precious because we thought we had lost him. There may be a tinge of sadness around the edges, though, I'm pretty sure some of us have begun to wonder how much longer this is going to last. Jesus keeps telling us he has to return to the Father so that he can send the Holy Spirit. But sitting with him like this, it's so reassuring. We can finally breathe. Now here's the part that you might not realize. You can have those relaxed, moments with Jesus any time. Just close your eyes and picture Jesus wherever you are or however you think of him. Imagine sitting with Jesus and talking with him as if you're talking to your best friend because that's what Jesus wants to be in your life. Your best friend as well as your Lord and Savior. Do you realize that this is one way to pray? Just have a conversation with Jesus. So I encourage you to try that sometime, maybe later today, maybe over breakfast tomorrow morning. To give you a little better idea of how it works, let me share something of my beachside meetings with Jesus. Because in seminary at Dubuque, in class on prayer, we did a guided imagery, something like that. 
You close your eyes and someone gives you general directions and your mind fills in the blanks based on your own experience and your own relationship with God. That's what it was like in class that day. And what I imagined was Jesus in blue jeans and sandals and a white t-shirt. And I was sitting on this very large stone next to a lake shore. Jesus came up, he started talking, went for a walk along the beach. And for the next couple of years, and once in a while since, that was a big part of my prayer life. I picture myself sitting on that large stone waiting for Jesus to come and talk with me. And I was never disappointed. There were walks along the beach, and walks in the woods, a lot of conversations, even communion. That was a big part of my prayer life. A certain stage. It's something that you can do too. I'm suggesting this one of the ways that you can communicate with our risen Lord. Having that conversation with Jesus, whether it's on a beach, by a campfire, over breakfast, or whatever, wherever, you may be surprised that Jesus will guide that conversation with you. For Peter, at least, a very serious conversation with Jesus was coming. And we will talk more about that next week. But for each of the disciples, I think there was reassurance in just spending that time with Jesus. It was something that they needed before they received their marching orders and their empowerment to go out and do the work that was coming very soon. And there's a rhythm to what I just said that's really important, so I want you to remember it. We need to spend time with Jesus for that reassurance, rest, guidance, refreshment, nourishment, before we go out to do the Lord's work. And hopefully part of that for you takes place when you come to worship. Or maybe it's in a small group or when you read your Bible or pray at home. We come here to spend time with Jesus, to be nourished with his word, and today with communion, to be reassured and refreshed. And then when you go out into the world each week to do the Lord's work, you know that you can come back to be renewed the next Sunday. But you can also spend that time with Jesus in your own devotions and prayers throughout the week. This rhythm is important to sustaining our efforts and remaining in full communion with Jesus. I want you to consider also the rhythm of Jesus guiding the disciples and the disciples following Jesus' direction. Because it is our job to haul in the fish, so to speak, to do the work of bringing people to Jesus. But it's also Jesus' business to point the way, to show us where the people are and to whom he is sending us in particular. And that's where we as disciples, and especially as a congregation, need to be in prayer regularly for Jesus, to show us his intentions his mission for us. And it may not be what any of us had in mind in the first place. It may not be what it was in another stage of our lives or another era of history. But we need to pursue where Jesus sends us now if we don't want to come up and handed. it. As we celebrate communion today, Imagine yourselves gathered with Jesus, sharing what is offered, what Jesus has prepared for us. And begin to pray this week for Jesus to show us where our mission lies. Take time regularly to spend that casual time with Jesus to refresh your souls. And then go out wherever he sends you doing his will. As we prepare now to share that meal with Jesus, we prepare for it with our songs, with our prayers, with our offerings, and with our thanksgiving. And so I ask you now to stand and share this hymn of thanks to our Lord.
loving and gracious God, we give you thanks and praise for the joys of this day, for the blessings we have received through the week this past, for the times that you have helped us and given us strength, for the days that you have provided for our basic needs and so much more beyond, for the friends that we enjoy and the families that we cherish. We praise you and give you thanks, O oh Lord. But we also thank you, God, for the times that you see us through our difficulties. We thank you for seeing us through illnesses, and we ask that you continue to bring healing to Annette after her recent illness and to many others. We pray, Lord, for those who have come through surgeries and for those facing surgery and those dealing with difficult things in the hospital. I thank you, God, for bringing my mom so safely through her surgery, for the recovery that she is in the midst of. Lord, we give you thanks for Cheryl playing the organ this morning. We pray for her father, for recovery from the heart attack that he suffered. We ask you, Lord, to bring full and complete healing to him. We pray, Lord, for those who have lost loved ones, and especially today for the May family, in memory of Larry May. We pray, Lord, for those who have suffered so much in Nepal, for those rescue workers who are still helping in recovery. We pray, Lord, for those struggling to understand and bring peace in the violence and turmoil in Baltimore and other places around our world. We ask, O oh Lord, that your justice be done. We ask, O oh Lord, that you help people find peaceful means of changing what needs to be changed. We pray, O oh Lord, for comfort for all who have lost loved ones. We pray, O oh Lord, for those who will engage in rebuilding, not only the buildings in both Nepal and Baltimore, but the structure of lives. We ask, O oh Lord, for your peace in so many places in this world where peace is hard to find. And we thank you, Lord, for the signs of new life. Whether it's the image of a little baby born this week in Nepal, or the image of a little boy handing water bottles to those who used to called him. Lord, for these things that we see on the news and the things going on privately in our own lives, you know it all. You know our needs. You know our worries and fears and concerns. You know our joys as well as our sorrows. And the good news for us today, Jesus, is that you deeply care about each thing going on in our lives. Thank you. Thank you. Lord, as we lift one another up to your throne of mercy and grace, help us to trust that you hear our prayers and that you are indeed at work in our lives, bringing new life and a deeper faith. And so to that end, Lord, we lift our voices in prayer as you taught your disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name.
Let us bring our tithes and our offerings, and with them our hearts and minds and our very selves to the Lord our God. Let us receive our offerings. Sin became our lot for all generations. 
we stand in need of a Savior. Through your prophets, though your prophets have throughout the ages called us back to the life you intended, and Jesus himself taught us your will, still we wander away and follow our own plans. Though we rebel, still you claim us as your own. You sent Jesus into this world wrapped in human flesh. He died on the cross, our kinsman redeemer, paying the price of our debt to you. For this, O oh God, we lift our hearts in joyful praise. Thank you. 
and place the empty in the big rack before you.
your eternal and steadfast love, we give you thanks and praise. Amen. Let us join together in our final.